is enough for me. Um, let's welcome Dr. Jen Kaiser. Uh, Jen is an assistant professor of obstetrics and gynecology and a family planning specialist. Her con clinical interests include contraceptive care for patients with complex medical issues, prenatal care, gynecologic care and surgery, miscarriage management, and in-office procedures. Her research interests are varied and include contraceptive counseling, mifepristone use for miscarriage management, adolescent contraceptive care, and improving reproductive life planning for women with substance use disorder. She grew up outside a small farming town in central Wisconsin. She completed a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in the history of medicine at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. After earning her medical degree at the University of Chicago, she went on to residency at the University of Utah, where she developed a keen interest in family planning. She then stayed on at the University of Utah to complete a fellowship in family planning. Outside of work, Jen enjoys gardening, hiking and camping with her family, and knitting and cooking. Dr. Kaiser, over to you. Thank you, Caitlin. Welcome, everybody. Um, as I'm getting my screen share up here, um, I just want to also reiterate that um, this is pretty informal, so please um, type your questions in or unmute yourself to speak up if you have a question or if you would like to share some of your own experiences. Um, I think that this is not necessarily a one size fits all um, approach to adolescents and their contraception. So please join in. I would love um, to hear from all of you with any questions you have. Um, so let's just jump right in. Uh, so today I'm, I hope that you'll leave this webinar with um, gaining some confidence in how to counsel adolescents about contraception, understanding the importance of confidentiality to this um, patient population in particular, um, and then also be able to identify some myths about adolescent contraception use. So well, first we're gonna start with a counseling deep dive, and I'm, I'm really going to spend the majority of the time today about this. We're going to cover confidentiality. I'm going to present um, an efficacy versus a patient-centered counseling approach, and then we'll go over a couple of key takeaways. And finally, we will cover the methods kind of in brief and mostly how they relate to adolescents. So things like pills patching and depo, LARC devices, and emergency contraception. But first, I just want to remind you all that teens do have sex. Um, by 12th grade, over 50% of females report having had sex, and really you can make a huge impact by helping them be safe um, and to prevent unplanned pregnancy. So I think it can be really easy sometimes to be like, oh, they're 15, they're not having sex. Let's, I'm just gonna skip that part of the conversation. Um, but it's just so important to keep in mind though that they actually are having sex and we as providers can make a big impact um, for those teens. So the other thing I wanted to point out is just that um, contraception is really kind of a key um, part of, of teen unplanned pregnancy. So in this graph, um, which is showing that although teen sexual activity, which is this kind of dark blue line here, has remained pretty steady over um, the past several years, and, and this is, you know, it was updated in 2016, so the data is a little bit old here. Um, but you can see that teen sexual activity is, is staying relatively stable, um, but this black bar is the pregnancy rate per 1,000 women, um, and so we've seen a steady decline in teen pregnancy rates, and that has continued even beyond uh, the 2012 of this graph, um, and in part we believe this is due to an increased use of contraception here in this blue um, with the central white uh, graph uh, line here. So, um, you know, contraception really is key to helping us continue to reduce the teen pregnancy rate for those teens that do not want to be pregnant. Um, and so, you know, this is where, again, we as kind of um, either OBGYNs or general health practitioners or um, nurse midwives, whatever it is, we can really make a big difference. So the counseling deep dive. So it's really important with your adolescent patients to set the stage. And that can um, really come down to uh, confidentiality. So I always bring up with my adolescents kind of right off the bat, I say, look, everything that we're gonna talk about here is gonna be between you and me. Um, this is all confidential. I'm not gonna go like back out to the waiting room and find your parent and tell them everything that we just talked about. 
but I also let them know that there are some limitations to that confidentiality. And that can be if they're using their parent's insurance, it could show up as an insurance claim um, if they get like STD testing or if they um, do you start a method of birth control? And so I always kind of ask them about that. And you know, here at, at the university, I um, if they they are using their parents' insurance and they're like, I really don't want my parents to know that I'm looking for birth control, then I would help send them somewhere where they can get um, reduced cost contraceptive services. The other thing is parental notification laws. So this is variable by state, and I'm going to talk a little bit more in particular about Utah's um, laws in just a moment. And then I also like to kind of gauge what the parental involvement is. Um, I would say from my, my own experience in like my own clinic, a lot of times the adolescents are bringing their parent with them to their visit. Um, and so usually they start off right away by saying like, I have really bad periods and I wanna start something for that. Um, or they're just like, I need birth control because I'm sexually active. And they're telling me this with the parent in the room. So obviously those parents are involved and kind of know what's going on. However, I always have the parent leave the room as well, and that's when I really set that confidentiality stage with the adolescent um, if a parent did come with them. And then I always like to ask when they're alone too and they say, you know, I need birth control. I say, what, you know, do your parents kind of know about all this? Like, what do you, how do you feel about that? Like, just ask if their parent is involved. About 50% of teens do involve a parent in these uh, reproductive health decisions. Um, and so it's good to kind of gauge, you know, and encourage involvement as you're able. Um, obviously, if the teen is telling you, like, my parents can't know because of X, Y, Z, that seems like um, it would be putting them in danger or, um, you know, the situation just is not really a good one for the parent to know. I mean, obviously, don't be like, please go tell your parents um, in those settings. So I think being being aware of that, but just asking sort of where where is the teen and their parent in sort of all of uh, the reproductive decisions that are going on. So the Utah law. <clears throat> so there was a law that was passed in 1983 that stated that um, adolescents seeking, and this is under the age of 18, um, seeking contraceptive services, it required parental notification. This was challenged by Planned Parenthood Association of Utah and was actually found to be unconstitutional. So under Title 10, um, there was no parental notification. However, right now, um, there are no Title 10 clinics in the state of Utah. That will hopefully change pretty soon. There's um, some groups that are working on an application. Um, but as of right now, we have no place to send our adolescents for um, confidential birth control uh, services um, through a Title X clinic. If a clinic receives federal funds, so like a FQHC or a private clinic, um, there's also no requirement for parental notification there either because this law had been found unconstitutional. However, the state found a very tricky way around this, um, and so they said that if you receive state funds for your clinic, um, or for your hospital, which here at the University of Utah we do, um, that parental notification and actually consent is required to provide contraceptive services to an adolescent. And I'm happy to answer some more questions um, on that if anybody has them. I know it's kind of it's a little bit of a sticky, tricky um, uh, rule that is going on. So back to the confidentiality thing though, and right on how this law sort of undermines that. So we know that without confidentiality, we see increased teen pregnancy rates. We also see decreased use of contraceptives. Again, like going back to that Guttmacher graph that I showed you at the beginning, these are very closely related as one kind of goes down, the other goes up. Um, and in one national survey, 59% of adolescents said that they would not seek contraceptive or reproductive health services if a parental if a parent was required to be involved. So that's, I mean, that's nothing to like joke about, right? 59%, that's a lot. Um, and so I think that this sort of, these kinds of laws are really signaling to adolescents that, you know, they're, they can't make decisions on their own and it's actually just keeping them away from getting the services that they want. Let me just check, I saw. Here in the chat. Oh, pl so Planned Parenthood, um, correct. Planned Parenthood is no longer Title X. So with the Trump administration ruling that, that 
clinics receiving Title X funds um, cannot discuss abortion, um, Planned Parenthood decided to rescind their Title X standing. So they are no longer a Title X recipient. So Planned Parenthood, they still can provide confidential contraceptive services to adolescents, but they are no longer Title X. So they um, can do that because they are technically a private uh, clinic. So you can still send adolescents to, to Planned Parenthood for confidential contraceptive services, that is correct. Um, but it is no longer Title X. Okay. Um, all right, so back to the sexual history thing. So. Um, the five P's, this is uh, what the CDC recommends for taking like a thorough um, sexual history. So asking your patient about their partners, about their sexual practices, what are they using for protection from STDs, do they have a past history of STDs, and what are they doing for pregnancy prevention. Quick aside here, and um, I'm happy to spend some more time on this if anybody wants to, but just to um, point out that our LGBTQ plus teens also need contraception. Um, they have higher unintended pregnancy rates than their straight counterparts. Um, and in one study that was actually done um, here, uh, one in three women who were seeking contraception identified uh, with a sexual minority. And so I think that it's really easy to make the assumption that because the teen in front of you says, I identify as a lesbian and I only have sex with women that they're not going to be interested in contraception um, either for purposes outside of, of like its use as birth control. So maybe they have bad periods and they would be interested in addressing that with a birth control um, or because you know they may have a male partner at some point down the road or a partner who has um, a penis instead of a vagina. And so I think it's really important not to make those assumptions and to still ask um, your teens who are identifying as sexual minorities if they would be interested in discussing birth control. So efficacy centered approach. I think that this is something that, that we're all pretty familiar with at this point. And this is a wonderful handout and I do use it a lot in my own clinic. I think it's very easy to understand. It has that nice column on the right hand side where it's like, you know, the one in 100 women are gonna get pregnant using this method. But if you only approach your counseling based on efficacy first, um, it turns out that you're really kind of um, leading your patients to select something that, that they might feel like you think is the best thing for them to use, but they might not feel like it's the best thing for, for themselves. Um, and so, you know, efficacy is well and good, um, but I think that solely relying on efficacy centered counseling is not really the best way to go for counseling adolescents about contraception. And I would argue really anybody about contraception, not just adolescents. So what about taking a more patient-centered approach? Um, so the CDC has these following counseling components. Um, they say to include efficacy in your counseling, um, the safety of the method, its availability, and its acceptability to the patient. I would say that acceptability, I've, I've put it in bold here, even though I left it at the bottom of the list, is probably the most important thing. Um, because as we know, really the best method is the one that's going to be consistently and correctly used. And the acceptability um, of that method by the patient themselves is going to be huge in like getting to that point where they're going to feel like they want to continue to correctly and consistently use um, the method that they decide on. So I'd propose a little teen-centered counseling, and we're going to go through this actually kind of a couple of slides here on this. Um, but teen-centered counseling should account for the, the current domains of the, the debate, sorry, the domains of development of the adolescent and where that particular adolescent is in each of these domains. So their physical, cognitive, social, emotional, and moral development. Um, you know, it could be that you have an adolescent who is in front of you who, um, you know, may uh, have an extensive social network already, um, is really busy on TikTok and whatever else the latest and greatest social media things are out there. Um, but, you know, maybe um, emotionally not really ready um, for sexual activity, but maybe are getting that pressure. So you have to really like 
take into account everything when a teen is coming in and asking for birth control or you're approaching them as well. So helping teens find their method. I want to just stress that when an adolescent comes to you for contraception, 78% know what they want already. So they walk into your uh, to the office saying already knowing like what is what method that they really want. So what so if 78% come in already knowing like do, you know what are what are we here for? What do we do? Do we still counsel them or we're just like yep sure here you go like Good luck, here's the pill. Um, so there's still components of this where I think that you can make a really big difference. Um, and that comes from a, a couple of different facets. So it's important when you're speaking with adolescents to establish your expertise, but still establish some trustworthiness and accessibility. So be open and non-judgmental. A lot of teens will say that they like it if you kind of ask them about their lives a little bit first and like what's going on, what are their plans for the summer or the fall or the winter, um, and you know, kind of getting to know them a little bit better before jumping right into sexual history and contraception. Um, another important thing is to avoid making assumptions. So like we spoke about a little bit ago, with LGBTQ plus youth, right, it's really important not to make assumptions about practices that teens have, their partners, um, what they need the birth control for, all of that. Um, it's really important to be very open and just ask. And finally, really be mindful of your body language. Um, you know, a lot of times adolescents are maybe nervous um, coming to the physician, especially if they're coming to a gynecologist. Um, and so having a really open and relaxed uh, posture, um, you know, being like close, making eye contact, all of those things can be really helpful to put the teen at ease, to help you establish that trustworthiness, um, but also to help you establish that accessibility, that you're not, um, you know, somebody, an adult in a white coat that's not going to listen to them. I think that it's really important to emphasize to the adolescents in your practice that, you know, you are going to listen to them and you want to, and you are going to seriously consider what they're saying and not just kind of blow them off as not knowing what they're talking about. So um, a lifestyle fit for their method can be really helpful. And a question that I like to ask really any patient who comes to me for contraception is what's important about birth control to them. So what's the one thing that they really want their birth control to do? And you will get a range of answers, as I'm sure if anybody has asked a question like this um, can, can testify to. But you will um, hear things from, I don't want to take something every single day. I don't want a lot of hormones. They make me crazy. And honestly, efficacy, right? If we go back to that patient-centered, to the, sorry, efficacy-centered counseling approach, I rarely hear efficacy as like the number one Thing that somebody is looking for in their birth control. Sure, I have in like people who, you know, maybe are really certain they are done with their childbearing um, and they're like, I just really need this to work well for me or they have other medical conditions that would make pregnancy dangerous. Um, but it's very few and far between that I hear efficacy as the number one uh, factor that they're looking for in their birth control. And I, th I think this just, again, emphasizes that the efficacy-centered approach might not be the best. So um, engage in information processing. It's very easy to get to like just overload adolescents with too much information about birth control. The details, all of the side effect profiles, their bleeding pattern changes, you know, kind of everything that goes along with it that that we just have like our little spiel that's very rote that we just kind of give off and then you're like, okay, what do you think? Which one do you want? So help the adolescent process that information. Give things in more digestible pieces. Um, ask them to repeat back to you or, um, you know, just assess for understanding as you go along um, can be really helpful for them to help um, process everything you're saying and then be able to arrive at a decision for which method they want, um, you know, without feeling just completely overwhelmed. It's important to review consistent and correct use of the method um, that they decide to, 
to pick. Um, also discuss the side effects before they happen. And it's, it's important to be really concrete and specific with the side effects when you're talking with adolescents. So try not to be vague about bleeding patterns or like, you know, potential for headaches or nausea or things like that. Um, because for a teen, that doesn't, it doesn't really compute that well all the time. But if you're like, you know, some people are going to have daily bleeding or every other day have spotting or irregular things during the month can be really helpful so that they kind of know what to expect and also so they don't get worried if that does happen. And then encourage them to call if they're having side effects that um, they didn't expect or even if it is something that they did expect but they're worried just tell them like please call anytime come back for a visit in the day and age of COVID right it's very easy to set up a virtual visit so you can say you know, hop on, we can chat about it um, virtually. You don't have to come back to the clinic. I, you can call me, whatever it is. Um, but again, being accessible is really important to help them troubleshoot these issues. So myth busting, um, also important. As I was saying before, um, you know, teens have pretty wide social networks now. And I'm gonna to get to that, this next like kind of big bullet point on this slide is a little bit more about that. But I'm asking, you know, what they've heard about the methods that they're asking about or the method that they want. Um, ask them if they have friends who've used this method and what the, their friend's experience was. Do they have concerns about that experience? And trying to, you know, kind of gently, um, correct those myths. Um, again, establishing your expertise and your trustworthiness. So not just being like your friend is crazy, there's no way that happened, um, but kind of explaining like this is maybe what happened and this is why it's not common or this is why this isn't a thing um, can be a good way to, to do that. And so the last thing here um, on this slide is the pre-visit personal acceptability. So before the teen, this is a really interesting study where um, before the teen came in for their counseling, um, they asked them like, what method is most acceptable to you? And then they tried to figure out like, what, what was it that, that led that teen to be, um, to be really accepting of that, that method that they wanted? And it turns out that it's heavily influenced by their social contacts experiences. So their friend had an explanation and XYZ happened and they either love it or they hate it. Um, you know, they're, the teen, uh, the teen's acceptability of that next plan. If you're like, hey, what about next plan? This is a great method. And they're like, oh, my friend had this crazy thing happen and she hated it and she had it taken out. And so there's no way I want that. So their, their acceptability of the methods you're talking to them about are going to be heavily influenced by those social contacts experiences. And so your counseling can either support um, the patients that come in with that high level of um, personal acceptability beforehand. So reinforcing either good experiences that others have had and that makes them really want that method or kind of helping with myth busting. Um, and then your counseling will inform those who don't really have a pre-visit acceptability of any one method or another. So be flexible with switching. Um, this is a reality and we're looking at switching and discontinuation of contraceptive methods kind of more and more and more um, out there in contraception research. And so switching is definitely a reality and we as providers should not be a barrier to that switching. So if somebody comes in and they say, you know, I've been on the pill for like four or five months and I just have nausea all the time when I take it and I want to switch methods, you know, and they're like, and I'm really sure about that and I, I don't want to use this anymore. Don't be that barrier that's like, just stick with it. Just stick it out a little bit more. Say, okay, let's talk about other methods and let's find you something that may work better um, that avoids that side effect. So it's not our place to try to convince people to stay with their method and I think that that is, um, very easy, a very easy trap to fall into, particularly with IUDs and Nexplanons. Um, but if somebody's like, I'm done with this and I don't like it, don't be the barrier to help them find a method that they'd rather use. And then of course, important to encourage dual use um, for STI prevention um, in your adolescent crowd. 
All right. And this kind of brings me to one of the big points. <laughs> Avoid coercion and directive counseling when you're talking to adolescents about contraception. This is not about you. It's not about what you think is best for the adolescent to use. I know that in the backs of our minds as providers, it's very easy to be like, gosh, IUDs are fantastic. and Everybody should have one. Um, but that is not the right way to approach this. And especially with teens, if they feel like, you know, I mean, for those of you who either maybe have like adult teenagers in your own homes or you've dealt with lots of teenagers in your clinics, I mean, you know, as soon as you like really start pushing on them to do something like that's it, they're going to shut down. So it's, it's difficult sometimes to always be very aware of this in your counseling, but I would encourage you and I would challenge you um, to really be aware of this and be like, am I recommending this method because it fits all those attributes the teen was asking about, or am I recommending this because in my mind, I think this is the best thing for this teen. Of course, some there some directive counseling I think is unavoidable um, because you may need to steer patients one way or another due to medical comorbidities um, for safety reasons, things like that. Um, but remember, this is not about you. You should be listening to your adolescent patient and and really um, trying to to have them tell you what it is that they want uh, in their birth control. So some key takeaways from the counseling really important to establish that confidentiality. Um, again, I would just kind of let you think and kind of stew on it a little bit about is efficacy centered the best way to approach this or more of a patient centered or teen centered counseling approach. Be non judgmental, be mindful of that coercion or directive counseling, and then also be easily accessible right for switching for talking about side effects um, for uh, you know getting the method they want like try not to be that barrier to the team okay any any questions about that stuff before we move on to the methods oh and lisa um i have seen this in area e um the the efficacy chart um it's it's in with like kind of the rest of our handouts on contraception contraceptives and things like that but i don't know about all of the other um clinics can we maybe get it to brenda or someone and ask them to make sure that it's placed in all of our clinics because i see a lot of teens and i love it i have not seen it down at madsen at least yeah, you can also, it's on the bedsider.org website, which is also a really great place to send teens who are maybe not sure what method they want. Um, it's a really like easily understandable website that has pictures of all the methods and um, is really, it's like a great thing. And so I think you can find it also there, but yeah, I'll talk to Brenda about getting it out and about a little bit. Um, just because I think it's, like I said, it's really clear um, and easily understandable, but I think basing your entire counseling on it is is probably not the best move. Right, thank and you. Just, and just to chime in too, um, so Bedsider partnered with uh, University of California, San Francisco to produce the chart. And luckily, um, one of the programs there, Beyond the Pill, has funding to provide that tier uh, efficacy chart to clinics free of cost. I know if you, if you order it through Bedsider, there is a small fee. Um, but if you go to beyondthepill.ucsf.edu and click on the tools tab, um, you can order posters, tear off sheets uh, in English and Spanish and, and also the emergency contraceptive chart they have too. Great, thanks Caitlin. All right, so on to the methods. Ooh, come on, Peter. There we go. Um, so selecting methods. So I just mentioned a little bit ago about making sure that the method is safe for the adolescent as far as any medical comorbidities that they may have. And so one thing that is really a useful tool is the CDC Medical Eligibility Criteria app. This is a free app. Um, and it breaks down different medical conditions um, by those conditions, or you can also search by method. So if you're like, this person really wants an explanon, you can click on next one on, um, and then you can go through all the conditions and see exactly what's recommended for each one there. So this one um, that I pulled up is for uh, deep vein thrombosis. Um, and I 
somehow managed to leave the methods off of the top of the chart, but the first um, column where there's a bunch of fours and threes, um, that are, is for the combined hormonal methods. And so a four means you should really avoid this pretty much at all costs. Um, a three means that the risks outweigh the benefits still. Two is benefits likely outweigh risks, and one is there's no um, reason that you can't use that method in this particular condition. So if you don't have this app already, I would recommend downloading it because not only does it have this wonderful medical eligibility criteria, um, but it also has the Selected Practice Recommendations or SPR. Um, and this is a really handy tool um, that can uh, help you with a bunch of different things. So I pulled up, uh, this is just a screen capture of the levonorgestrel IUD. So it can give you information on initiation. So like, can I quick start this method? Meaning, can I place this IUD for this patient today? Um, and it, it that then takes you to this thing about how to be reasonably certain that somebody is not pregnant. Um, what exams, what tests you need to do before starting the method. Uh, and then it also has some great troubleshooting tips like bleeding irregularities. Um, you know, what do you do if somebody has PID? What do you do if somebody's pregnant and they still have an IUD? So lots of really great information in there. All right, so pills, patching, and depo. Um, so pills, of course, are the most common method used among adolescents, but they also have the highest rates of discontinuation. So 48% report continuing at one year. So just over half actually will stop their pills some point in the year, uh, the first year of their use. The other important thing about pill patching and depo is to, you know, figure out with the teen um, some strategies for consistent use. So you know, ask them, how are you going to remember to swap out your ring every month? How are you going to remember to take your pill every day? Um, so helping them kind of brainstorm some ideas uh, for how to remember to use these methods that do rely on um, multiple uh, timings. Depo. So I think there's a myth here that Depo is not safe for adolescents due to the um, risk of decreased bone density over long-term use. So the um, FTA put a black box warning on Depo uh, that said you shouldn't use this beyond two years. However, um, there is evidence that shows that that's, that kind of cutoff of two years really is not um, uh, a reasonable thing and that you can use it much, much beyond that. So um, we know that the bone density, uh, any loss of that is reversible. We see no difference in bone mineral density at 12 months of use of depo in adolescents in particular. There's no increase in fracture risk with longer term use, and there's no adverse long term impact on bone health. So we haven't seen in some studies where they looked at postmenopausal women who had reported depo use um, as a form of contraception, those women are not at increased risk, uh, don't have increased rates of osteoporosis or um, fragility fractures. And then there's also no evidence to use estrogen as an add back therapy for somebody who is using depo um, for more than two years. IUDs and teens. I think there's a lot of misinformation and myths that are floating around out there about um, teens and IUD use. One of those is that you can't use them at all in adolescence. Another is that you can't use them in somebody who's never been pregnant. Um, that you have to have STD testing completed and resulted prior to insertion. So in particular, gonorrhea and chlamydia. Um, and that you have to use a smaller frame IUD like the Skyla or the Kylina in your adolescent patients. And I wanna tell you that each and every one of these is false. So um, the IUD actually has like a much uh, pretty high continuation rate at one year of 74%. Um, and in a study, this was out of the CHOICE study where they offered free contraception in St. Louis, um, they had a lot of um, adolescent and uh, never pregnant or nulliparous patients in this study. And they actually found that 95.8% of the time you can successfully place an IUD in the first attempt in those patients. And that's without any mesoprostol preparation, nothing. It's just the patient came in and said, I want an IUD, then they placed it at that time. So the vast majority of these you're going to 
be successful in placing at your first attempt. Uh, in adolescence, expulsions, perforations, and infections are all very rare still. Um, it's recommended, the IUD is recommended by the American Academy of Physicians and the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists um, as an acceptable method and even a, a quote unquote first line method um, for adolescents. And then if you have a pregnant teen that you're seeing and you're discussing birth control, um, they can have an IUD placed immediately postpartum, so after delivery of the placenta. How do you pick? How do you help the teen pick which IUD if they're not sure which one they want? Um, so the leave and adjustable IUDs, so the full-sized ones, which are the 52 milligram, the Mirena or the Liletta, um, are good for up to seven years of use for um, pregnancy prevention. FDA says five years on Mirena, six years for Liletta. We have amazing data out to seven years um, and the Liletta trial actually is going to 10 now and so we'll see it could be that someday Liletta will be approved for up to 10 years of use. Um, the hormonal IUD has the positive of having lighter bleeding or even causing amenorrhea, improving dysmenorrhea. So if you have a teen who's like my periods are horrible, they're kind of all over the place, they're heavy and they hurt, this could be a really nice choice for them if they're interested in an IUD. Um, because it does treat that abnormal bleeding. The copper IUD, of course, is good for up to 12 years. FDA says 10, but once more, we have really great data out to that 12-year point. No hormones. So if your patient is very concerned about hormones um, or has had like bad side effects from other hormones in the past, this could be a nice option. Uh, we do see a temporary increase in bleeding and pain that at six months does uh, get a little bit better, but maybe not all the way to their baseline period. Um, you get regular periods, so if that's important for your teen to just, I want to make sure I'm having a period every month, um, this is a nice method. And then you can also use the copper IUD as emergency contraception placed within um, up to five days from unprotected intercourse. So the IUD insertion. So you can collect a gonorrhea and chlamydia at the time of your insertion, and you should follow CDC screening recommendations. So if you have a patient who just had a gonorrhea and chlamydia screen done two months ago, they are <coughs> um, with the same partner. They don't have any additional risks for um, contracting gonorrhea and chlamydia. Fantastic, you don't even need to test them, just put in the IUD. Um, obviously, if it looks like somebody has acute cervicitis happening or you're worried about acute PID, test them, don't place the IUD, but pretty much in everybody else, you can do your swab at the time of placement and then treat them if it comes back positive and leave the IUD in place. We know that NSAIDs reduce post-insertion pain. Um, they don't help during insertion. There's actually not much of anything like kind of shy of moderate sedation um, that can help with insertional pain itself. One thing, so here's where a lot of people, well, here's where, where one reason for a smaller frame IUD um, can be considered here is that the, the inserter tube is smaller. And so in one study where they looked at insertion pain between the kind of full size like a Mirena versus the um, smaller size like Kylina or Skyla, um, there is reported to be less pain with insertion with those smaller frame IUDs um, than with the large frame, but the pain after insertion is no different. Um, and you're getting a shorter duration of use with those smaller frame IUDs, and you're probably not going to see as favorable a bleeding profile if that's something that's important um, to your patient is to really reduce their bleeding. So the trade-offs kind of between the Skyla Kylina and like a Mirena or Liletta um, is some reduced pain with insertion, uh, but kind of the longer term benefits of using the, the, full, the full size IUD, um, you know, may not, it might not pan out and it might not be like a really good balance there. So something to discuss with your patients. Um, but I, uh, I, we actually took a poll of um, our family planning providers here with all of our um, years of experience uh, and a bit of, IUD insertions and like the thousands and thousands of IUDs that our division has placed. Um, and we decided that between the four of us, our nurse practitioner, Dr. Turok, Dr. Gowan, and myself, um, we have probably placed maybe eight to 10 Skyla or Kylina 
Um, so again, there's, there's really not a lot of indications to use them. Um, so don't feel like you are obligated to, unless of course your patient is like, I just really want something for three years and the Skyla sounds great. Perfect. Um, and then finally, there's also no evidence to use mesoprostol as a cervical prep before your um, insertion attempt in adolescence. The only time that mesoprostol can be helpful is if somebody has had a failed uh, insertion attempt prior, um, but mesoprostol tends to make people feel pretty miserable, so we tend to avoid it um, for just routine insertions. All right, next plan. So um, again, FDA approved here for up to five years, for sorry, three years, but we have good data out to five. Um, so I've been, I tell all my patients they can keep it for up to five years if they so desire. For adolescents, I feel like the next plan um, is more popular than the IUD. Uh, it's less scary, right? You don't have to have a pelvic exam. Like you don't have to be like you're putting what where. Um, and it's also very concrete. So the IUD, I feel like they're like, you're putting this T-shaped thing inside of me somewhere and I don't really understand where that is, even if you like draw pictures and have models and all that kind of stuff. Um, whereas the next one on, they can just feel it in their arm and they're like, that's my birth control, it's there, I know it's there, it's working for me. Um, also really high continuation rates at one year, 84%, but of those that discontinue, about 50% will do it for that irregular bleeding. So I think it's important to be upfront again about side effects like we talked about earlier, especially with the next plan on and that risk of kind of an irregular and unpredictable bleeding pattern. And then again, if you're um, seeing pregnant teens in your clinic at all, this is also something that they can have placed before they leave the hospital following their delivery, if that's what they want. All right, emergency contraception. This is our last little bit and we'll, and we'll open it for more questions. So all of these methods can be safely used for adolescents. Um, the copper IUD is um, the most effective form of emergency contraception. Again, it can be placed um, within five days following unprotected intercourse. And if somebody's also looking for like a longer term um, birth control method, this is a great thing to do. Of course, they do have to come in um, to have it placed. Um, stay tuned, there's also some exciting uh, developments coming from a study that we just completed here uh, where we randomized patients seeking emergency contraception to the Paragard or to the Liletta, the levonorgestrel IUD. Um, there were about 600 people randomized and there was only one pregnancy in the whole study. Uh, that is all I can tell you right now, but uh, stay tuned for hopefully when that, that paper comes out. Um, and then Ella and Plan B, those are the oral forms. So Ella, you have to have a prescription for, um, but this one is more effective than Plan B and can work um, again within those five days following unprotected intercourse. This one works through uh, the LH surge at preventing ovulation. So that's why its window is a little bit broader than plan B. Plan B um, available over the counter um, for 17 years and older, um, not as effective in uh, patients who are heavier. So over 80 kilos, roughly 160 pounds, um, I would recommend Ella uh, or the copper IUD for those folks because we see that really the plan B does is like pretty much not effective really at all um, in the higher um, weight groups. This one you should really do within three days, um, prevents ovulation before the LH surge, but if you've hit the LH surge already, um, it's not going to be as effective. Okay, so just to wrap up kind of the key takeaways from today. So important to establish confidentiality, um, you know, Think about that efficacy-centered counseling. It may not be the best. Um, be non-judgmental. Be mindful of your directive counseling. Be easily accessible. And then IUDs and adolescents, like, go for it. If that's what they want, don't be the barrier. All right, thank you. That brings us to the end. If anybody has questions, I would love to answer them. while we're giving folks a second to type in their questions, Jen, I'm, I'm curious, do you have any specific techniques that you use to, um, you know, in, in thinking about, right, our own biases and our own agendas in letting go of our concern for that patient's risk of unintended pregnancy, right, and, and letting it 
letting them choose the method that really does work best for them. Um, how do you how do you confront that? Yeah, so uh, it takes time. I can remember when I was a resident, um, especially when I was in like my first couple of years of residency, and I was like, IUDs are the total jam, and like everybody should have one. And I ha I was very directive in my counseling towards being like, let me tell you about this really great thing. It's called an IUD. Um, and you know, I think that just over time, doing a lot of self-reflection on that, but also doing a lot of more broad reading about, you know, questioning this like push of LARCs, LARC devices that had been happening um, in like the late aughts. Um, you know, I came to be like, gosh, I'm part of, I'm part of that problem. Um, and so a lot of kind of self-reflection and then being really aware of like what is coming out of my mouth when I'm sitting there with a patient. And I, I honestly like caught myself, she wasn't an adolescent, but um, I caught myself just the other day being like, you know, somebody was like, yeah, I'm thinking about switching up my birth control. I'm going to get pregnant in a little bit, but not yet. And I found myself talking immediately about IUDs. <laughs> um, and so it's just something you have to be continually continually aware of. Um, and then, you know, and like call your own self out about it. If you get out of an encounter, you're like, wow, I just, I just did that. And, you know, say, I'm going to, I'm going to do better next time. Great. Thanks for sharing. So we do have a couple questions. Um, one, how much does having an IUD in place increase risk of PID if the female has a risk for STI or multiple partners? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it actually does not increase your risk. Um, the hormonal IUD, because of how it, its mechanism of action, right, is to thicken the cervical mucus. And so once it's been in place, so, so highest risk of infection is just post-insertion the first 21 days. Um, but once that cervical mucus builds like this really kind of thick barrier, um, and so actually there's some evidence that suggests that a hormonal IUD and to some extent the copper IUD, although this has been studied a little bit less extensively, um, is actually protective um, from PID. Not saying that it's not possible to happen, um, but I don't tend to be too worried about increasing somebody's risk of contracting PID if they have um, risks of STIs or multiple sexual partners and they're using an IUD. Obviously you always want to promote condom use for prevention of STDs. Um, but again, I don't think that it's increasing their risk uh, that really at all to have the IUD in place. Great. And we had another question come in. Um, do you recommend IUDs under age 15? And I guess to extrapolate from that, is there a, a lower age limit that you would consider? Yeah. Um, I have placed IUDs in 13-year-olds who have had really heavy, heavy, heavy bleeding. Um, and there's really, you know, I think it, it, it has a little bit to do again about like their developmental status. So assessing tanner staging, um, you know, do you think that this is a uterus that's going to kind of be big enough um, for an IUD? Um, and then, you know, talking with the, if the parents are involved and in talking with the teen. Um, one thing is that oftentimes in these two 13 year olds that I've placed IUDs in, for their bleeding, um, we did both of those with sedation, um, just because the, you know, the ability to tolerate an exam like that when you're 13 is like not, not great for a lot of um, adolescents. And so you want to make sure that they're comfortable, you know, with what you're doing and that everybody's kind of on the same board, uh, on the same page. Um, but I, you know, I don't really have like a direct age cutoff that comes to mind. I think it's more based on their physical development. Um, and, you know, and if that's what they want, either for bleeding control or for um, contraception, you know, then I would, I would feel fine providing that. Jen, this is Lisa Roberts again. So we've talked off and on sort of jokingly, but not so jokingly, about looking at getting nitrous into the outpatient clinical settings for IUD placements. Um, and I actually think it'd be a great idea. Do you know if we're considering that at an institutional level or any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I have heard, yeah, that being kind of bandied around as well as a possibility. I don't know where we're at with if that is going to become a reality. Um, 
I know with like COVID and everything right now, they're like not allowing us to use nitrous anywhere. <laughs> um, right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think we'll have to see like what if we if we ever get through all of this. Um, kind of what is going to happen from there. And I think there's been, I'd have to look back in the literature to see if there are any studies with nitrous for IUD placement. I'm pretty sure there are. And I just off the top of my head can't think of what the outcomes of those were. Um, yeah, but it's, it's definitely something to look into as well. Yeah, oh, IUDs and acne, that's a great question. So, um, it's it's kind of it's unclear I think still the effect of hormonal IUDs and, and acne a lot of um, adult women will say that when they start their IUD their acne gets worse but oftentimes they're switching to the IUD from some other form of hormonal contraception and so when you're taking something more systemic the sex hormone binding globulin um, increases. And so you're actually pulling some more of those androgens out of the systemic circulation by increasing that binding globulin. Um, and so when you switch from something systemic to something that's not very systemic at all, um, I think that that's where you can sometimes see a flare of this acne. Um, the hormone in the IUD is levonorgestrel, which is a type of uh, progestogen that does have more androgenic effect than some of the other synthetic progestogens that are out there. Um, and you know, and everybody's a little different. So um, some patients, right, don't have any, most I would say don't have any hormonal side effects from the hormonal IUD and others do and um, are a little bit more sensitive to that very small increase in systemic levonorgestrel. Um, but I, you know, as far as like the direct impact on the acne, I haven't seen too much of a detrimental effect on it, but um, again, like if somebody's like, I had this place and now my acne is totally out of control, um, it's definitely worthwhile to consider that the IUD could be the culprit. Well, great. Thank you so much, Jen. If questions come up, if everyone's percolating on them and questions come up, feel free to email me after and we can, we can uh, get Jen's response um, afterwards. All right. And I'm going to take the screen back. Great. Um, so let's talk about claiming CME credit. So for those interested in, in claiming the one CME credit for this webinar, we will email you the code and instructions uh, once you've completed your post webinar survey. If you've set up a CME profile with the university before, the process is very simple. You just call into the phone number and enter your event code. If you haven't set it up with you before, you'll be asked to complete a brief form before claiming your credit. And one thing that I want to emphasize is that um, the CME credit must be claimed before midnight tonight. If you try to enter it in tomorrow, it will have already turned into a pumpkin and it will not work. Um, so the instruction guide I'll be sending out afterwards should answer mo most of your questions, but don't hesitate to email me if you need any help. And finally, we ask that you complete our post webinar survey. Just like with the pre-survey, there are three different ways to get there. Um, you can type in the URL in your browser, you can click on the link in the chat box and I'll have Maddie paste that in there again for easy access. Or once again, use that QR code with your smartphone. And the survey will ask if the webinar has taken place yet. Please answer yes so that the appropriate questions appear for you. It has been an absolute pleasure hosting you all today. We hope you'll join us monthly for new topics in our webinar series. Next month, we welcome Dave Turak uh, to present on emergency contraception. Thank you all, take good care of yourselves. And with that, I will leave you to the survey. <laughs>